If we want to go to heaven, we have got to trust and obey. I have a good idea that that song is very meaningful to many members of the Lord's Church. Many of us have sung this hymn since our childhoods. And it encompasses what we must do in order to be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. Trust Him with all your heart. Trust Him with all your soul and with all your mind. Trust in Him with all your heart, believing in Him. And that belief, of course, also means responding in obedience as well. And that's a biblical theme that just runs throughout the Bible that we are commanded to trust God. We can trust in His character and we can trust in His Word. We believe what He says and we know that He will fulfill it. He will keep all His promises and all He asks of us is to humbly obey, to submit and humbly obey what He says. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Now this morning we talked about the Trinity, didn't we? As we continue our study of the ABCs of Christianity, we talked about the Trinity and the love of God, of course, has been so marvelously demonstrated in so many different ways. For all of mankind, it was not any better demonstrated than what we saw or what we know by faith on Calvary's cross. We can see it in our own mind. And so it is that the love of God is that which reaches out to us and thus embraces us. And then we have the responsibility, if you will, the joy and the privilege of being able to respond to that. And so it is in 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. That's right. We really have to ask ourselves this question. If we consider the cross of Christ, and if that does not motivate us to a closer relationship with God, then what then would do that? What is it that might motivate us? It's doubtful of there being anything else that can motivate us more than the love of Christ, the cross of Christ. I'm sure of it. And so when we turn our backs upon the cross, we really are rejecting the very word of God, the very love of God. Think of what Jesus said on some other occasions. For example, in John 14, 15, when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's pretty simple enough, isn't it? It's understandable. All right, if you claim to have this love for for me, then listen to what I say and follow me in obedience, Jesus is talking. Jesus seemed as if he could not really comprehend the one who would say, well, Lord, Lord, have we, have we not done the things? Well, he says, wait a minute. Those who are saying, Lord, Lord, and do not the things that he says, I, well, he, he, is, he is less. He is less and he will not be able to go to heaven. So trust and obey the two go to heaven. The two go together, right? It was the great apostle of love, John, who had so much to say about not only God's love for us and about our love for God, but also our love for our fellow man and especially our brethren. And he also joined together this idea of, of trust and confidence and obedience. He says in 1 John 2 and verse 3, he says, Hereby we do know that we know him, if what? If we keep his commandments. So it is that by listening to God and heeding his divine will, I am what? I am expressing my love. I express my devotion. I express my appreciation and my obedience as well. We likewise express our trust in Jehovah God. You know, he goes on to say something else in 1 John chapter 5, and he further elaborates on this point. 
But he says in verse 2 of chapter 5, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And notice this phrase, his commandments are not grievous. They're not overly burdensome. There are those who would consider keeping the commands of God as a very difficult thing to do. It's amazing. You know, only Jesus ever kept the commandments of God to perfection, but yet through him, we can be reconciled unto God to start life all over again. Isn't that wonderful to know? Yes. And here becomes the guiding principle in our lives. Let us do whatever we can to obey him. I'm thankful that his forgiveness is still available. But it's also a privilege to know that we can obey God and know this about his commandments, that they are not overly burdensome, that they are not grievous. They will not hurt us. They are for our benefit. You know, so many times we get our thinking warped and we we think just the opposite. But the writer of Proverbs says that the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs 13, 15. That his life is the one who really has difficulty. And so it is that we ever strive to be pleasing to God. If we are pleasing to God, it's going to be through our obedience. Pretty simple enough. Let's think about God for just a little while this evening. Let's think about his character, for example. Trust and obey. But you remember the words of the Pharaoh who, who said in Exodus 5, 2, he says, Who is the Lord that that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. That's what the Pharaoh said to Moses when Moses had said to him, you need to let the people go. Let my people go. Who is God? Why should I obey him? Why should I listen to him? Well, probably the Pharaoh needed a message on the character of God. And really he, he got it, didn't he? Because over the course of the next 10 plagues, he learned just how powerful God really was and really is. Exodus 7 through 12. And so there is a God in heaven. And I'm reminded also that in the New Testament, uh, another great preacher on the behalf of Jehovah God, that Paul had went to the city of Athens. And we find that he said there in Acts 17, 23, You need to know about the true God of heaven. And he says, now let me introduce him to you. Right? We will never be able to fully appreciate God and be able to put our trust in him and thus submit ourselves in obedience to him if we don't know him. If we don't know him. And so Moses says, I'll show you God. Mr. Pharaoh. Paul says to the people, let me introduce you through the God that you ignorantly worship. Let me teach you about him. And by the way, when you speak about God, there is no bigger subject. As I said, even this morning, you know, who am I to be able to preach about God? I'm down here. God's up there. I'm, I'm a lowly person. I only know what he's revealed to me. But you see, he's the biggest subject that we could ever talk about that we could ever speak about the brightest subject and the very best subject that the mind can possibly fathom. But what about his personality? We know this about God, that he is a person, that he has a personhood, as we learned even this morning about the Godhead, that God is a living, breathing entity. As a matter of fact, speaking of breathing, he gives the man the breath of life, didn't he? In Genesis 2, 7. And so we're not just dealing with just some kind of cosmic force out there that some of these other religions might believe when we speak of God. We're dealing with one who has some attributes that can be understood by all of us, and they are personal in nature. They are personal. God knows, He acts, He feels, He loves, He speaks, He is knowable. 
And so it is in Hebrews 11, that great chapter on faith, we learn in verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So God does exist. And the Bible itself testifies of his existence. And there in the beginning of time, you have God speaking and doing. God spake and everything was created. Just spoke the words. That's the power of the Almighty. And we can trust him. Trust him with regard to his power. He can do anything and then consider that he's not likened unto us in flesh and blood. You see, God is the spirit. God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Jesus said that. Now, if we are made in the likeness of God, how so? Well, he has given us a soul, hasn't he? It is not that God is flesh and blood, and we all understand that, but he made us a certain way. He, he made us his physical beings, but he implanted something within us called the soul that will live forever, and that soul will eventually one day, or sometime or another, that soul will return to God. Now, if you want to like to mark things down, you can mark that down. I don't know where to mark it. But you can mark it down. That soul will eventually, at one time, whenever it is, will return to God. It could be when you die. It could be when Christ comes back and returns his own back to the Father. But it will return to God. And so one day it will return to God for his safe keeping. It will return to God for his judgment. The soul returns to God. Now it's the physical body that returns to the dust of the ground. He is a spirit, so God is person, God is spirit, but what about God in his nature? Well, he's an eternal being. Psalm 90 and verse 1 speaks of God being from everlasting to everlasting. We talked about it a little bit this morning. You know, it's hard for me to really understand that which has no beginning or no ending. That, that doesn't that doesn't even calculate within my mind. No beginning, but everything has a beginning. No ending, what do you mean? Everything's going to eventually end. No, that's God. He's eternal. You see, I, I cannot with this finite mind really understand that, but I will one day. And I know this about God, that he is eternal in his being. He is eternal in his nature. Therefore, when one looks backward... He finds God. One looks forward. He likewise finds God. If he also looks towards his sides, he's going to find God because he is the only one true God and he's a holy God. Separate from us, high and lifted above us. And I remember hearing a preacher say something like this when when he would preach, he would remind us that God is up there and we're down here. That's just it, right? Now, he did not mean by that that we could not know God. He did not mean that God cannot be a, a, a father unto us. He did not mean that God was not interested in us because obviously he is. But he was trying to remind us of the reverence that we ought to have of God. In Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God of heaven. And so therefore we who recognize the nature of God and understand that we are made in his divine image know something about submitting to his will. If indeed God is an eternal being, he always existed and always will, therefore God is holy and righteous. And he makes his will known to man as a part of his creation. As that part of his creation, we can think and we can reason and we can come to obvious conclusions within our own mind that we have a responsibility, right? We have a responsibility, don't we? And that responsibility we have is to be obedient unto him. Trust and obey. 
To be obedient under him. So it is when we think about God the Father, we want to study his attributes. If indeed there is a God in heaven, and there is, and if he created all things, including each one of us, and he did, and if he made us the crowning achievement of his creation by granting unto us a living soul, then I want to spend my life knowing about him. What can I know about him? Well, I can know this about him. He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent, which simply means God is all-powerful. He is almighty. There is no area at all where God is lacking in any power. And so we see that from the very beginning of time in Genesis 1-1, when he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He made the sorry host, Psalm 19, 1 and 2. That heavenly host daily testifies to his existence and to his power. I love studying the Bible just to get an understanding of that creative power of God. And not only that, but the constant display of his power as well. We've studied on occasion the crossing of the Red Sea. We think about that. That was a mighty sea in that particular area where they had to cross. Would you have liked to actually have seen that? I, I pictured that it within my mind and I, I thought how wonderful it would have been to be able to see that Moses would then put that forth that stave and all of a sudden, those waters would just separate to make walls of water. And the ground was dry. Where all of those Israelites, some were roughly one million to two million people, to cross over on dry land. How wonderful it would have been to be able to see that. If, of course, we would have wanted to be the ones that also would have crossed as well. Right? But God, through that servant Moses, opening up that body of water and the children of Israel going through, God himself leaping over the ivory walls of heaven and coming to earth below, being born of a virgin. I, I pictured that within my mind. It would have been nice maybe to have been a shepherd at that time to be able to, to see that very happening of the birth of Jesus. But by faith, I can. I can see it within my mind. Because I read the Word of God and it tells me exactly what happened. That Jesus was born. What about the power of Jesus? The resurrection, Romans 1, 4. By the power of God, He walked up and out of that tomb. When I understand God's power, then I'm, I'm drawn closer to Him. I say, I want to know more about him. I need to recognize his greatness, but I need to listen to him as well. Because the same God that can speak the worlds into existence, the same God that can open up those walls of water on, on, on the Red Sea, the same God who can come to this earth by means of the virgin birth, the same God who walked up out of the tomb by the might of his resurrection, that same God can also come again, and he will. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3.10 And so it is that I must comply, I must understand my responsibility before him while I live here on this earth and comply in obedience to that very thing. He is omnipotent. And therefore, the one with whom we have to do is highly exalted. And it will benefit us, benefit us greatly if we listen to him and submit our will to him. He's omniscient. That is, he knows all things. He knows all things. Psalm 139 says that there's no way that you can run from him. We know of a fellow that tried to run away from God, Jonah. Hebrews 4.13 speaks the same thing. You cannot run. Oh, you cannot get away from him. You can't find a place where you can say, well, God is not here. No, God is everywhere. 
So he knows all about us, past, present, and future. That's what makes him God. But then God is also a God of love. And we consider his omnipotence. We consider his omnipresence. We consider his omniscience, all-knowing. But God is also the God of love. The God of love. And so if indeed God loves us to the extent that he created us and he grants us into a wonderful atmosphere in which to live, a wonderful environment called earth, then surely that says something to us about his care for us. But then when you take that and go a step beyond and consider all that all, spiritual that all spiritual blessings are found in one place, and they are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3. His cross, therefore, becomes that much more meaningful when you think about it. If I go to Gal Calvary's cross and I see what Jesus did, then I have a, a, a sense of obligation. I have a sense of responsibility. What then must I do with what I know? What an awesome thought to think about God. And what perhaps is even more awesome and thought is that he's interested in me. He's interested in you. How wonderful it is to even think about that. Do you think about that? Remember, God is knowable. And if I find him interesting enough to get to know him, surely if God can be interested in us, we should be interested in him, right? And so the song suggests that we trust and obey for there is what? No other way. There is no other way. No other way what? To be happy in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what it says? But to trust and obey. So what is it that the Lord says? Well, in this book, the Bible, we have many statements that he has made that were made by the God of heaven, his son, Jesus Christ. And by the way, when the apostle speaks by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what is he doing? Well, he's speaking the will of God, isn't he? That's right. So when I listen to that inspired apostle, I'm listening to God's voice. When I listen to Jesus, I'm listening to God's voice. And so we listen to these various commands of God. And we say, you know, God says, this is what I must do. And I can do it. And that I can do it. No gripe about it. No, don't complain about it. Just take it. How wonderful it is to be able to say, yes, I obey God. I obeyed God and how helpful it is to obey God. What do I mean by being helpful to obey God? That it just benefits my life. It will benefit your life. Because when I've been obedient to God, I never have to apologize for forsaking his will. I never had to travel the avenue of repentance when I've obeyed God. It's just a much easier path to follow. That is the pathway of obedience. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. I demonstrated to you that I love you. You can trust me. I'll keep my word. Won't lie to you. But he says, but then why do you say you love me, but you forsake me? You see, the person who doesn't really love God will have no interest in a statement like Mark 16, 16, where it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He must not be in love with Jesus or the person that doesn't love God will not be interested in sacrificial giving, will he? Being present to worship won't be of that much more importance of the person who really has never fallen in love with God. And so it is that you can continue to think about your life and how it relates to God. Do I rebel? Do I find it repulsive or am I drawn closer even though I oftentimes falter?
God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to show your love for me. Well, God, how can I show you that I trust you? Just believe me and follow my will. Just believe me and follow my will. Just trust and obey. (laughs) Pretty simple enough. And really, what is a person saying when he obeys God? He's saying this. First of all, the person is saying, as I obey, I am demonstrating my love. My trust. As I obey, I show my desire that I want to be associated with God himself. Those two things, I'm demonstrating my trust in him that I believe what he says. And number two, I want to be close to him. I want to be associated with him. And so we trust, take his word and simply obey it. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. First of all, I trust what he says. I really do believe what he says in that verse. And therefore, that is the reason many years ago I obeyed it. Because I trust in it. Not only that, I can look at various other passages and say, here's what God says about this. I'm going to obey it because I understand the blessings and the benefits that come to me by so doing. You know, he won't go back on his word. He won't come before, you won't come before Christ in judgment and he says, well, here's what you did, which was in accordance with my will, but I changed my mind about it. No, he's not going to do that. Because we learned how to trust and we trust that causes us to obey and to obey is to be blessed. What did the hymn writer said, say? He says, when we walk with the Lord, blessed is the man that walks with the Lord. Just read Psalm 1. And in the light of his word, Psalm 119, verses 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my pathway. You know, David said, thy word have I hid in my heart and as a result that I might not sin against thee, right? In Psalm 119, verse 11, very, very important to understand that. If we put our trust in God and his righteousness, And obey his very will, his divine will. We will have the blessings, the spiritual blessings that are only in Christ. Because we're going to obey his word. We're going to obey the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We're not going to let anybody stop us in our obedience to that. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. I want you to really think about those three words. How important they are. And how important they can be for your salvation. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you put your trust in believing that, That you put your trust in knowing that I've got to make a change in my life. And make those changes as soon as possible. That I will be willing to let it be known before these many witnesses. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And be obedient to that very gospel. Going down into the waters of baptism to rise to walk in newness of life. A new creature, a child of God, a Christian, where all of those spiritual blessings that we talked about will be found in Jesus. Will you even do that tonight? Maybe you're here already a child of God. You've allowed sin back into your life. You don't know really how easy it is that sin can creep back in. That we need to repent of those things. Pray that God will forgive us 
as a child of God that is erring in that situation, make sure that sin is gone, repent of it, and pray that God will forgive you. And we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Maybe you just need prayers of the church to strengthen you, to help you, to comfort you, to, to build you up. We can pray for you in that way as well. Are you in need of the gospel call? Won't you come? As we trust and obey. Won't you come?